Okay, just like just like we had before, we had our authentication protocols on the wired side. It would go to um, it would make sense that we also have the same capability on the wireless side. So anything you can do on one, you'll be able to do on the other. And so there are three different types of authentication protocols that you should be familiar with. And we'll talk about them here. Extensible authentication protocol, uh, lightweight ex extensible authentication protocol, and protected extensible authentication protocol. And as you can tell, you know, you're starting out with the baseline and then you're increasing from there. And we'll talk about the details of each one of those here. Mm -hmm. Same exact methodology as what we were talking about for these memory tricks. Okay. Um, although these are not all of the different types of uh, extensible authentication protocols, I do have uh, a couple of different areas that you may be interested in. Um, in preparation for the exam, really, I would say that just be familiar with the definitions and understand what they do instead of having to get into the details of, you know, pre-shared keys and MD5 and all of this stuff, right? And uh, we'll talk about, you know, what you really need to know for the exam in the next, uh, next slides. This is just more for um, completeness. Okay, so what does lightweight extensible authentication protocol do? So it took the original extensible authentication protocol and Cisco said to themselves, hey, look, is there a way that we can make this more usable uh, by the community? And so the problem with the extensible authentication protocol is that it used web, okay? And you needed to fix that because if you can crack the encryption within, you know, five seconds or two seconds, you want to be able to fix that. So they went ahead and did that, but the problem was is that um, they only did it for like iOS. They didn't really do it and deploy it for Windows. And so there was a big desire for that. And so it was considered kind of a weak replacement uh, for it, but um, it was an improvement in terms of security. So what they did was they moved up to protected extensible authentication protocol and now, instead of having a situation where they didn't have any Windows support, they now were able to deploy that. And what it utilized was it actually utilized keys between the endpoints, which is a much better situation. And of course, now it's protected, right? Versus not having that with the uh, web deployment. Okay. A um, couple more terms uh, before we finalize is um, everybody's probably familiar with an SSID. So, you know, you go on to your wireless, you take a look at all of the, the uh, access point names. That's essentially what your, um, um, your SSID is. But now you should also be familiar with two other terms. One is called a basic service set identifier, and one is called an extended service set identifier. Okay? So a BSSID is actually, you know, like on an um, Ethernet card, you actually have a burned in address on there. It's like a, it's like Mac, a Mac address. address. Well, this is exactly the same thing. It's, it's the Mac address, but for the wireless card. Right? And so that's what we call a basic service set identifier. The SSID, of course, is the name that you give to that access point that's broadcast to everybody. And then in the event where you have multiple um, access points that are being used, or multiple SSIDs, then you have the extended service set identifier. We'll talk about that here in a second. Actually, I guess we'll talk about it now. <laughs> okay, so in the event that you wind up having a scenario where you're using multiple SSIDs, but you have them all having the same value, there may be a desire to kind of break those up. And that's the nice thing about having this extended service set identifier because it's a value that identifies which access point is being utilized. Okay. I thought I had another slide in there on it. 
Okay, the final thing that we will talk about for today is the wireless organizations that you should be familiar with. Um, the FCC is the one that actually allocates all of the different frequency ranges and values. And so what they do is they talk to, like, if you need to get licensed to use a certain frequency range, the FCC is the organization that you would submit that uh, to. Right? They're also the ones that actually provide that there's a, a big chart that shows all of the frequency allocations for the entire country, and those are the ones that maintain that. There's actually an organization inside of the FCC that does that. Um, the ITUR, uh, the ITU radio communication sector, they provide um, global management of radio frequency. So there's administrative districts throughout the world, and really they just do the coordination with organizations because if you're trying to manage something in the United States, um, whether that has an effect on somebody in China, you know, you know, there's a big question or whatever. But each one of those states or, or um, nations is the one that manages those resources. This is just a map of all of the different regulatory regions for the ITU. Uh, so it's a difference between the Soviet Union and China. So they do, they do this they do this based off of you know geographical and political boundaries. So yeah. So that's uh, that's a good point. But you'll notice that the regions themselves have different region numbers as well. And then finally, the ISO. Uh, so these are the same guys that actually came up with the OSI model. So ISO equals OSI. It's just a you know palindrome for it. Um, and essentially, this is the one that does most of the standards and uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. So I know we went through a lot of information today. Um,